A second role that we see prophets playing in this section of historical narrative, we see prophets as God's zealots. And here again, there's a contrast between true prophets and false prophets. You find it particularly in those zealous Yahwists, Elijah and Elisha. The Elijah stories are found in 1 Kings in chapters 17 through 19 and 21. 1 Kings 17 through 19 and 21. The Elisha stories appear towards the beginning of 2 Kings. Chapters 2 through 9, a little bit in chapter 13. These materials are good examples, again, of independent units of tradition, popular stories that were incorporated into the Deuteronomistic history. They are highly folkloristic. They have lots of drama and color, plenty of miracles, animals who behave in interesting ways. That this material began as a set of folk stories is also suggested by the fact that there's a great deal of overlap in the depiction of the activities of the two prophets. So you have both of the prophets multiplying food. Both of them predict the death of Ahab's queen, Queen Jezebel. Both of them part water and so on. But in their final form, the stories have been interspersed with historical footnotes about the two prophets and then set into this framework, this larger framework of the history of the kings of the Northern Kingdom. So they've been appropriated by the Deuteronomistic school which remember is a southern Judean-based Deuteronomistic school. They've been appropriated for its purposes, which include a strong condemnation of the northern kingdom of Israel and, and her kings as, as idolatrous. So Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, which means that he comes from the city of Tishbe in Gilead, which is the other side of the Jordan. Elijah is a very dramatic character. He comes across the Jordan. Um, he's dressed in a garment of hair and a leather girdle. At the end of his story, he's sort of whisked away. One of the king's servants surmises by the wind of God. He does battle with the cult of Baal and Asherah. We associate Elijah most with the battle with the cult of Baal and Asherah. This had been introduced by King Ahab to please his Baal-worshipping queen, Queen Jezebel. And as his first act, Elijah announces a drought. He announces a drought in the name of Yahweh. Now this is a direct challenge to Baal, because Baal is believed to control the rain. He's believed to control the general fertility of the land and, and life itself. So Elijah's purpose is presumably to show that it is Yahweh and not Baal who controls fertility. We have very good evidence that Baal was in fact worshipped in the northern kingdom right down to the destruction. This is something we touched on earlier as well. It's quite possible that Israelites in the northern kingdom saw no real conflict between the cult of Baal and the cult of Yahweh. But in the Elijah story, the Deuteronomistic historian represents these two cults as being championed by exclusivists. It's one or the other. Jezebel, Ahab's queen, kept a retinue of 450 Baal prophets and was killing off the prophets of Yahweh. Right? And by the same token, Elijah is equally zealous for Yahweh. He refuses to tolerate the worship of any god but Yahweh. And he performs miracles constantly in the name of Yahweh to show that it is Yahweh and not Baal who gives life, for example. He, he raises a dead child, he multiplies oil and flour and so on. All of this in the name of the Lord to show that it is Yahweh and not Baal who has true power.